those uh, 7 p.m. services open to everybody. But uh, so thankful for those that are going to that. And uh, praise God. I want to turn uh, your attention to the uh, Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 12. You know, I was thinking about, you know, how I think there was a song that uh, was written many, many years ago. I don't remember the title of it, but it said something to the effect of what a difference a day makes, 24 hours. And, uh, most of life, I think, pretty much every day unfolds for the most part the same. Uh, not too much new, not too many new things that take place that happen, and uh, it's very, very easy just to kind of, you know, just take day for day. That's what we do. Um, it's those unexpected events that happen, whether it's in the workplace, something breaks, or. At home, something breaks and uh, can really shift uh, our mindset sometimes, and shift uh, you know what's uh, how we feel, uh, our responses. Jesus made a statement in Matthew six thirty four about you know taking no thought. Uh, King James says for the morrow, but he was just saying don't take any thought about tomorrow. Tomorrow shall take thought of the things of itself, because we don't know what's gonna to happen tomorrow. We knew it happened yesterday. The older you get, it's very easy to forget those things which are behind. But um, taking no thought for tomorrow uh, can be, in some cases, challenging, especially if you're dealing with something that, um, that uh, is important to you. Maybe it's an event, maybe it's a, uh, tragedy, whatever. I don't know if you've ever experienced waking up in the middle of the night with a thought on your mind and it just doesn't seem to go away. And you think and you think and you think and you think and you try to shut your mind down, you bake a cake, and you do it all kinds of different things, you know, during the night. But uh, Jesus, the reason why he said take no thought uh, for tomorrow, because tomorrow has enough thought of itself sufficient unto the days the evil thereof so we understand that and i believe in taking no thought for tomorrow it's probably easier said than done nevertheless we don't want to ignore tomorrow but because tomorrow could be a changing event in your life that's right yeah. you know something can happen uh loss of a loved one uh job report uh whatever there's so many different things that can happen in life and we just kind of floating wrong day after day after day and all of a sudden tomorrow comes and it's a whole different landscape it's a whole different setup it's so we can't forget about tomorrow and and i think of that relative to our relationship with god and walking with him um there's sometimes when i pray to him i you know, Monday morning, sometimes I'll say to him, said, oh, it's, it's Monday, Lord. And uh, I'll say I'll, I'll say to him, Brother Allen, I'll say, I got fog brain today, Lord. You know what fog brain is? Anybody know what fog oh, brain is? Yeah. <laughs> I got fog brain, Jesus. And uh, actually, I said to him this morning, I, I said, I, I don't even know how to pray this morning, Lord. It was just a, just a mental block that was there. And I, I said, I need your grace. Would your spirit do the praying today, Lord? And uh, it was just incredible. A little while later, just the Holy Ghost took over and off we went flowing in the spirit, praying in the Holy Ghost. That happens more often than not. But the echoing sound of the voice of God in this hour is to be ready, to prepare ourselves, to be ready. And Jesus in Luke 12, starting at verse 35, Jesus said, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. Now, when you can consider that, to make that statement, of course, everyone knows that in those days, they everybody wore long robes. And it was pretty hard to function if you, if you were in a long robe. You really couldn't probably walk fast. You couldn't run. 
And so they used to they used to reach down and grab the bottom of their robe and, and tie it in a sash, a girdle sometimes, so it would give them the flexibility to be able to work, to be able to run if they had to, uh, move more freely. And Jesus has said, said, let your loins be girded. That's what he was talking about. Ha, you know, have it in your, you know, like uh, Ephesians 6 talks about having our loins girded about with truth. And your lights burning. Of course, they didn't have electricity in those days. So if they knew somebody was coming over to the, to the house, they'd make sure candles were lit. They would have light so people could see, they could eat, they could talk, they could fellowship. But Jesus is using it with respect to, to his return. And he says, let your loins be girded about, your lights burning, and you yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him. And he uses the word immediately. I'm convinced, Sister Sue, when Jesus returns, it is going to be so quick so unnoticed to us it's going to be like we're here today and boom mm -hmm. oh. it, it's going to happen immediately and jesus references that your life and my life needs to consist of having our loins girded about with truth as we walk not taking for granted the next step pondering everything that we're doing, pondering the things we're saying, pondering the things we're involved in. He said, verse 37, Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he comes, shall find what? Watching. 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 We've heard the phrase, oh, that, that caught me off guard. Oh, I was surprised by that happening. And, and we just kind of, float through circumstances in life without really any thought given to, you know, sometimes if I'm doing something that I know uh, might be dangerous, I'll force my mind to say, well, I got, I got to hold this, I got to hold this tight, or I got to do this, I got to be conscious as I'm going down these stairs, I got to, you know, and I have to purposely put my thoughts onto my actions to make sure that there's not a slip, there's not a fall, there's not a spill, there's not a breakage. And who would ever dream that that would break tonight? I wasn't expecting that. I didn't walk through the day thinking that my stand would break tonight. And it, and it shouldn't have broke. It was, I didn't do anything hard to it. It just seemed to snap. But it's those instances that take place that changes you know, we were almost 15 minutes late before we started service because in my mind, I got to get this fixed because I want to I wanna be able to broadcast the service tonight. So you see how being watchful, especially when it comes to walking with, with the Lord and, and the, the thing that goes immediately to our minds, well, what, what, what can I possibly do? I got to function, I, I got to work and I, you know, I've been born again. I, 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 I'm special to him. You know, he's applied his name to me and every, you know, so we don't really, we think, okay, I've got, I've got all the real important stuff set aside. So really, what do I have to be watching for? Jesus said, verily, I say unto you that he shall gird himself, <coughs> those he finds watching. He shall gird himself and make them sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. This is the Lord saying what he's going to do to those he finds watching. People don't just backslide out of the spur of the moment. People don't walk away from, the, from God at the spur of the moment. That's right. Yeah. Usually when people leave the church or leave their relationship with God, it's, it's something that's built up through it, through, through time. <clears throat> yeah. Probably they quit praying. Or maybe they didn't think prayer was really that important. Or maybe they allowed other things to, to, to squeeze their time. I, I don't really have time to commit to that. Maybe they felt they, they read the word enough and there was no need to, to read it anymore. But in a moment's time, things can change to that person finally saying, oh, I don't think I'll go to church tonight. 
and then the next service, I don't think I'll make it to church tonight. And, and if you've been in this for any length of time, you see how easy that can come. We've seen people receive the Holy Ghost, get baptized, testify of the goodness and grace of God, the excitement of God. And all of a sudden, you don't see them one service or two services, and you try to reach out to them, and they don't respond. And you, what's going on? See, when that happens, they're not watching anymore. They're not conscious, conscious of, I don't know, I was looking at my father's picture t today, sitting in my chair, and I just happened to go through, brought up my photos, and I, and I looked, and it was two days before he passed. We were at a restaurant, getting ready to have breakfast, and, uh, and I find myself saying to myself, wow, he's gone, he's dead. And, uh, that's just how the unexpected can be. Jesus said in verse 38, if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. Oh, it's easy to be in the first watch, seeking God, praising God, Praying and reading the Bible. It's refreshing. But as the second watch comes in, by now you're starting to feel a little tired or a little, a little uh, weary. You know, that's why not many people come to midweek service. They, yeah, I've been working all week. I got home, got to fix supper, got to eat, and go to church. By the time I get home, it's be 9 o'clock at night. Oh, man, I don't know. And forget the third watch. You want to be in bed, sound and asleep by the third watch. But notice what Jesus says. You see, when he comes back, some of us are going to be in bed. Sound and asleep. Amen. Some will be just getting up at the crack of dawn. Verse 39, he says, And this know that if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered or permitted his house to be broken through be ye therefore ready also for the son of man comes in an hour when you think not the devil is very very good at causing distractions and ironically he uses our life's circumstances to enhance those distractions i don't have this or this person's doing this, or you just name, name, name a circ circumstance, and the adversary knows how to capitalize on those circumstances that irritate us, on those circumstances that upset us, that we allow to, to steal our peace, steal our joy. He knows exactly he's been watching mankind forever. I don't believe he can read our minds and I don't believe he's omnipresent. However, he knows human beings. He knows our flesh. Mm -hmm. And he knows how the flesh responds to situations that can arise at any given moment. So he lurks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he can push a button and get them upset uh, at a brother or a sister or a circumstance or a situation or, or, or feed the thoughts in the mind. The uh, English Standard Translation of Luke 12:35. Uh, says, stay dressed for actions. In other words, your loins girt about. That translation say, says, stay dressed for action. I remember there were time in uh, Marine Corps training when we went to bed, we couldn't, we couldn't go to bed as normally. We, ha we had to stay dressed, even with our boots on. Because sometime during that night, the drill instructors were going to come through the squad bay yelling and screaming and telling us to get up and get outside on, on, the, uh, on the road because we were going for a, a run. We were known as the Running O's. I was in Oscar company. My lieutenant was a fanatic for running, so everywhere we went, we ran. And he would wake us up sometimes at 2 o'clock in the morning to go for a run. And it wasn't a run around the block. Sometimes it was a three-mile run or a five-mile run. And so you just never knew you had to be ready. You had to almost the saying goes, sleep with one eye open because you never knew who was going to come down and what was going to take place. Jesus references the watch in Mark chapter 13, 
in verse 35, if you'd like to go there. And again, he says, watch ye therefore. I think the Bible is full of instances where people were instructed to watch. Solomon, in writing the book of Ecclesiastes, he says, I believe it's chapter 3, you know, that it's a time to do this, a time to do that, a time to do this, a time to do that. And he lists a whole lot of stuff that we're familiar with. And uh, I, I think probably the wording in Ecclesiastes that uh, resonates uh, with all of us is the statement that he uses there's no new thing under the sun how many would agree with that tonight That's right. Amen. it's no new thing when you think of the pursuits of man when you think of the quest of man and everything there man is trying to achieve you know the, the security the uh, provisions and all the other stuff that people us also want to be comfortable and want to have um if we're honest with ourselves, there is no new thing under the sun. We've entered into a new economic season where, you know, gas prices are higher and shelves are getting empty and prices are going up. And it's like, oh, what's going on here? And it's very easy for the adversary to come along or even our own flesh to say, oh, what am I going to do? I can't afford this. And somebody, uh, somebody mentioned something about gassing up their truck and it was over $100. And uh, when before it wasn't that much, you know, so people are beginning to question and uh, of course the politicians, it's their fault. And, uh, you know, Judy and I were talking about it a little tonight when she got home and it's just incredible how some of the pricing and the percentages that are going up and the things that you can't find anymore. And, and uh, I was at the uh, supermarket and I wanted to get some half and half for coffee and I said to the girl, I, I said, said, any idea when half and half's coming in? Because they haven't had it for maybe a week or two. And she says, I hope it's soon. I, I've got one container left, you know. So next day I went in, they still didn't have it. I said, it looks like we're both going to be out of, out of half and half. But it's just those little things of life that, that can throw us off a little bit. And, oh, well, what am I going to do now? And finally I found some and used to paying maybe a buck something and I paid three forty nine for a quarter half half an hour three forty nine that's disgusting it is disgusting but what are you going to do about it if you want half and half you got to pay the price so people are in this state of of what is going to happen next you know can you imagine having a baby now and not being able to get formula and then uh, it just we're living in changing times folks and it's going to be very, very easy for us to drop our guard with respect to watching. I'm not saying we're going to backslide. I'm not saying we're going to leave the church. But I'm saying that the conscious, conscious effort of prayer, reading the Bible, talking to God throughout the day. Don't find yourself praying the same way all the time. Tr change it around. Allow the Holy Ghost to take you into mountains and valleys in the spirit of prayer. Uh, try to find something different so that you, you're not a creature of habit when it comes to your walk with God, when it comes to your, you know, your commitment, if you please, to Him. You say, well, I am committed. Yeah, you are. Every one of us is committed to the degree that we're committed. But do I have to do something else? Have I taken inventory? Have I asked the Lord, is there anything that you're not pleased with? Do you find yourself saying to him more often than not, is there any part of my life, Lord, that you're not happy with? Oh, we'll say it's not sin, but could we be upsetting him? Sometimes people upset us and it's no real big deal, but to us it's a big deal. And there's things in life that sometimes you couldn't classify it as sin, but maybe, just maybe, the Lord is a little upset that you continue to do what you do or don't do what you don't do. Jesus said it in Matthew, uh, Mark 13, 35. Watch ye therefore, for you know not when the master of the house cometh. He could come at evening. He could come at midnight. Or he could come at the cock crowing or in the morning. So depending on, on your resource, the first watch, it's believed the evening, was from 6 to 9 p.m. The second watch at midnight, from 9 p.m. to midnight, 
the third watch at the crowing of the rooster, midnight to 3 a.m., and then the fourth watch, the morning watch, was 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. That's a lot of time within there. Amazing how the Lord has given each and every one of us 24 hours. But some of us find lots to do in that 24 hours, and some of us don't really get much done in that 24 hours. Oh, we're functioning, we're walking, we're doing things. But how much is, of it is kingdom related? How much, are, how much am I so focused on my relationship with Jesus and my walk with Jesus? And everything I do throughout the day, oh, Jesus, help, Lord of heaven. I mean, you're just, you, you always, he's always on your mind. You're always talking to him and praying in the Holy Ghost or rest in refreshing tongues or just, I mean, so consumed with the spirit of God. That even if something is to catch you off guard, it's like, oh, well, so be it. Because you're connected with him. You're watching. You're on guard. You're, you're dressed for battle. You're dressed for, for travel. Whatever he may, he may call upon you to do. I think of Israel in Egypt getting ready to, to leave. Maybe some of those folks had been... Uh, slaves for many, 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 many years. Maybe some of them were kind of young and, and uh, the uh, weariness of slavery, maybe their scars weren't as bad as dad's were or grandpa's were. And, and, but when they got the word that, as the Lord says to Moses in Exodus chapter 12, about getting that lamb and you're going to eat it, and you're going to do this and you got to do that. And, and you know, in the urgency of our everyday life, sometimes it's easy to take shortcuts. Well, I'll, I'll do this, or I won't do that, or, well, I, wait a minute, well, I might have time to get that done. But the specifics of God's Word and the specifics of the life that He's chosen for us, you get so wrapped up in life, you get so wrapped up in, your, your, in the things that you want, the things that you want to do, you can very easily miss this microscopic piece of influence that God says, all right, I told you that lamb cannot have one blemish. So if you don't want to take that lamb and flip it over and make sure there's nothing broken, no blemish on that thing, you don't want to do that, that's fine. But if that lamb has a blemish and you try to offer it up to me, you're going to lose. You see, God is a God of specifics. And sometimes I think he does things and he allows things just to see how we're going to respond and how we're going to act. I don't want to forget about tomorrow. I don't want to ignore tomorrow because tomorrow could be changed. Tomorrow I could get news that I've got terminal cancer. Tomorrow I, God could take Judy home. Tomorrow one of my kids could go to be with the Lord. You, you, you just don't know. No, that's right. Exodus 12, 11, Thus shall you eat it with your... No, oh, there it is again. Look at that. You're not just going to sit down and have a meal. You're going to sit down and have this meal with your loins girded. You're going to be dressed for travel. Your robe's going to be picked up and tucked into your sash or your girdle. You're going to be ready to fly out the door. Matter of fact, forget about tradition of taking your shoes off and leaving them at the door. You have those shoes on your feet. This is a special night. Thank God he told them what was going to happen, huh? But how many times does he expect us to know based on our relationship with him? As I've heard it said in these last days, he's going to need to tell us, don't go down that street. Don't go to that regular route that you take. You need to take a different route. Something's waiting for you there. And your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So Moses comes along and he shares that. Verse 23, he shares that with the people of, uh, of the Lord. And it says, for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. Oh, huh, thank the Lord. He's going to, they don't know anything about 
blood sacrifices and they're surely not going to kill a lamb and put their blood on their doorpost and, and uh, they don't even believe in God. But you continue to read there, it says, the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians and when he sees the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses and smite you. Are you ready? Are we ready? Really ready? To answer that call when that call comes? In Exodus chapter 12 and in verse 11, I want to read the, I re, want to read you this verse in the expanded Bible translation. It says, this is the way you must eat it. You must be fully dressed as if you were going on a trip with your loins girded. You must have your sandals on your feet and your walking stick in your hand. You must eat it in a hurry. This is the Lord's Passover. I'll never forget when we, the first time I went through the chow hall in boot camp and uh, as we walked through the door to get our food, you know, of course, it's morning, we're ready to eat. Man, we're starving. Young men, you know, Marines, got to have a good meal. And the drill instructor says, today we're eating duck. Duck? What in the world is duck? <laughs> when you go through the child hall, put your tray out, they'll put food in it and you eat it. While you're going down the line, when you get to the end of the line, put your tray on the counter and go out the door. And make a formation out there. It was the craziest thing. You talk about guys trying to feed their faces. And, and the child line was probably as long as that red wall over there. You started and they, a biscuit here, a, a piece of sausage here, and scrambled eggs there. You did what you needed to do to get as much food as you could. Because when you got to that line, your tray went into the kitchen and out the door you went. It wasn't the same kind of meal or the way they were used to eating when the midnight hour struck. And when the midnight hour struck, trust me when I say, there was a sense of relief that they had did it exactly the way the Lord wanted it done. Amen. And when I think of the excuses that are being being talked about now, when I the 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 the, the lines, the the limits, uh, well, I can well that's not really important. Well, that's your interpretation of that. Well, it's I don't think God made that. I posted something on Facebook today. There's not going to be any signs of protests or opinions being held up. And we all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And I, we see the signs of our day, you know, held up. And the, uh, this is my opinion about this. And this is my right. And, uh, and you don't have any say in this. And, and, and you're this and you're that. And we're going to protest. There won't be any of that at the judgment seat of Christ. Because he's going to be holding up his law. Lord Jesus. And he's going to be saying, this is what you've had around you since the beginning of time, but you ignored me and you've ignored my sign. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 4 in the Passion Translation. It's one of those simple scriptures that just, it makes a lot of sense. Proverbs 20 and 4, but I want to read it to you in the Passion Translation. If you're too lazy to plant seed, it's too bad when you have no harvest on which to feed. <laughs> is, is that profound or what? Well, hello, if you don't plant seed, you're not going to eat. You don't have food to eat. But it's those little jewels of Scripture that God throws in there, Sister Sue, to let us know there's certain things that you don't do it, you're going to go without. And then if you're not preparing, if you're not putting away, if you're not watching... Being aware of the times, being aware of the seasons. The reason why Israel survived the years of famine in Egypt is because God gave Joseph the wisdom, said, hey, right. you 
build these silos, told them a certain percentage of grain to take and put that away. And when the famine comes, everybody will be all set. That was a God thing. And we're here and the gas prices are going up and some of the food is being scarce and prices of food and different things are changing. Seasons are changing. Are we watching? Are we listening? Are we seeking? Forget about, take no thought for tomorrow, but don't ignore it. Because tomorrow, your life and my life could change dramatically. Yes, sir. Stand with me if you would. Matthew 25. It's one of the most enlightening stories that you find in the Bible is the, the story about the ten virgins. And Jesus says in Matthew 25, 10, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten vir virgins who took their, their lamps. And as you continue to, to read through there, the, the Bible talks about, you know, they all, they all, you know, were conscious of the day, I guess I could say it, from that perspective. They, they knew it was time to grab their lamps. And uh, will we ever get to a point where we're going to have to not really depend on our physical situation, circumstances, and things, and we may may need to be ready didn't isn't there a scripture where jesus said if you're on the roof don't come down don't come down and try to go back in you you need to head for the hills they needed to be watching they needed to be aware of 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 the, of the situations the season that they were in and we need to be aware of this season right now more committed than we've ever been committed it's not business as usual we don't take our salvation for granted we don't take our prayer life for granted Amen. we don't take our knowledge of bible for granted Amen. because there's all kinds of things trying to thwart our walk in relationship with god telling us that this doesn't matter anymore that doesn't matter anymore and there's going to be a great falling away there's going to be many many that are going to leave the faith and give heed to seducing spirits and if I've got this lackadaisical ho-hum, I'm a child of God and I'm just going to keep on doing what I'm doing and I'm not going to change and I'm not going to investigate, take inventory, I could very well be seduced by someone that comes along that's teaching the doctrines of devils. You say, oh, that wouldn't happen. No, ask the persons, ask the people that it happened to. Ask somebody that you know that used to be in the faith. This isn't in, they're not in the faith anymore. Right, not in the true faith. That's right, Pastor. There's a lot of people that say, oh, I'm a child of God. I'm a believer in Jesus. But they're not a biblical believer in Jesus. And they're not teaching a biblical version of Jesus. Amen. And there's a difference, my friends. In the Amplified Translation of, of the Scripture, the classic Amplified Translation, 1 Corinthians 16, 13 Listen to what Paul says. Be alert and on your guard. Stand firm in your faith. Your conviction respecting man's relationship to God and divine things, keeping the trust and holy fervor born of faith and a part of it. You see, Paul understood. Paul was connected. Paul was an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he wrote to these churches and the things that they were dealing with, many similar to the things that you and I deal with every single day, but there was always a, a warning. There was always a be on your guard, be prepared. Let your conviction respecting man's relationship to God and divine things just you know, maybe it is time to get radical. Maybe it is time to speak up and say, no, that's sin. No, that's murder. No, that's wrong. And let the chips fall where they may. I mean, it's going to come anyway. As Brother Shelton said recently, he said, if you're not ready to die for it, you're not committed enough to it. Whew, that's a profound statement. Yes, it is. And he says, act like men and be Courageous, grow in strength. I mean, Jesus is coming, folks. I don't know when. And 
I'll continue to forget those things, do my best to forget those things which are behind, and I'll do my best to forget and take no thought for tomorrow, but I'm not going to forget what I fell into yesterday because I dropped my guard. Yeah. Yes. And I'm not going to be ignorant about tomorrow and the danger that's coming. And whether it's in the first watch, the second watch, the third watch, or the fourth watch. Right now, we all need to be on our own wall watching to see what's coming down the pike. To see who's trying to, trying to sneak into my spirit. Trying to get into my, into my spirit. Trying to get into my mind and convince me of things that are not true. Convince me that whether I'm in the truth or not, or why should I care, or why should I go the second mile? Praise God. I want to be ready, church. Let's pray in Jesus' name. Father, power of the Holy Ghost, speak to us, Lord Jesus. Search us, my God, in Jesus' name. Show us the path to take. Show us the road, Lord. We want to find ourselves sitting at your feet and learning more of you, Jesus. More of your expectations, Father. We pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that you would give us a watchful spirit, my God. You told us not to be weary in well-doing. You said we would reap if we faint not. Help us, Lord, when we're sowing to our flesh. Smite our hearts. Convict us, O Lord. Turn us around, Jesus. Help us to be on guard, my Father, for the times and the seasons that we're in and entering in. I pray your grace be upon us tonight, your peace that passes all understanding. I pray mercy, Lord Jesus, and long-suffering to accompany each and every one of us, Lord, as we walk another day, Father. Lord, in your name, Jesus, we look to you, Father, tonight. We thank you, Father, tonight. Pray divine utterance be given to your church, to your people. I plead your blood as a covering and a hedge about them, Lord God. Angels would encamp about them and protect them. I pray grace over their homes, over their families, my Lord. Grant us traveling mercies when we go to and fro. And I pray, Jesus, in your name, that your will would be done, Father. Because it is your kingdom, by your power and for your glory. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. Amen. Praise God.